The Mariana Trench in the Western Pacific Ocean is the deepest place on our planet. If you throw a rock into the water, it'll travel 36,000 feet before touching the bottom. But unlike your body, the rock won't experience any unpleasant consequences. After all, it doesn't get affected by all that immense pressure that builds up the deeper you go. But then, what would happen to your body at the very bottom of the Mariana Trench? Put on your flippers. It's time to dive. Hold your breath. You're five feet below the surface, and it's still pretty comfortable down there. You're used to this depth. You go that deep when diving in the pool, or maybe at the beach when watching exotic fish swimming near the bottom. But you're serious about reaching the deepest point of the Mariana Trench, the Challenger Deep. So you keep going. 32 feet, that's where you start to feel some discomfort. Here, the pressure pushing down on your body has doubled. Your ears and lungs feel a little sore. This is because people have many air pockets in their bodies. And under pressure, these pockets shrink in volume, and you can feel it. But don't worry, your organs aren't made of metal. They're flexible enough to withstand even more pressure than that. What you should worry about at this depth is the white shark. If it wants you for dinner, you're in worse trouble than high pressure. That's why you'd better keep diving. Around 65 feet underwater, that's where you'll need a flashlight and air tanks as you're running out of breath. The sun's rays barely reach here, and it's pretty dark. For the same reason, you're getting cold. How about putting on a thermal suit, which is what divers usually wear? Ah, it's better now. But even though you feel warmer, your ears are starting to hurt a lot. And your lungs have shrunk almost three times their normal size. This can be risky for an untrained diver. But you're brave enough. And now you're already at a depth of 100 feet. Only professional divers go that deep without special equipment. The pressure here is three times higher than what you experience on the surface. Something weird starts happening to your body. Mm. It's not like anything you've ever felt before. And the reason is your air tank. The compressed air inside is mostly nitrogen, 78%, and oxygen, around 21%. But that deep down, nitrogen becomes kind of toxic. It can make you do strange things. Like, you may forget you're underwater and pull off your oxygen mask. But if you take tanks with more oxygen in them, the dizziness and other strange sensations will pass. 200 feet below the surface, the pressure here is seven times higher than on dry land. Now, even the oxygen becomes unsafe to you. You have to breathe some gas with helium in it. A sharp drop to a depth of 700 feet. This mark is the world record in free diving. Herbert Nitsch once managed to reach that deep without any special equipment or air tanks. After that, he received the title of the deepest man on earth. In 2012, he tried to break his own record and plunged to a depth of 830 feet. But it didn't end well for his health. Anyway, if you trained to hold your breath for that long, you would probably have very few problems now. That deep down, you need to start looking around again because there can be heavy traffic. Submarines travel at this depth, and you sure don't want to collide with one of them. A few more feet deeper, and you've reached the limits of the average human's body. At the same time, laboratory experiments have proven that people can withstand even higher pressure. It went like this. A diver entered a special chamber the size of a room. Scientists simulated high pressure, comparable to a deep dive, inside this chamber. This way, the researchers discovered that a trained person can withstand the pressure similar to that at a depth of 1,600 feet. But the diver couldn't just walk out of the chamber after the experiment was over. At high pressure, nitrogen, helium, and other gases build up in the body. And if you normalize the pressure at once, those gases form into bubbles. The consequences are extremely unpleasant, to say the least. So you have to do a gradual ascent from this depth. This way, the gases can leave your body in a natural way. Sometimes a dive takes a few minutes, but coming to the surface stretches for many hours. It's all about safety. Okay, now you have to put on a special suit. 
otherwise you won't be able to dive any deeper. It can protect you at a depth of up to 2300 feet. The suit's sealed and the pressure inside is exactly the same as on the surface. But all too soon, the suit's protection isn't enough anymore. You need a new means to continue your descent. And that's the Triton 6600 submarine. Now that you're sitting inside a large iron machine, you feel as if you're driving a car. Only this vehicle is worth $5.5 million. You certainly don't want to smash it, so be careful. You've reached a depth of 6,600 feet. Don't even think about getting out of the submarine. The pressure here is 200 times greater than on the surface. Your body just won't survive this experience. There's still almost 30,000 feet to the bottom of the Mariana Trench. If you teleported right there, a huge column of water nearly seven miles high would press down on you with all its force. Your sightseeing tour would be over before it began. Even pressurized submarines can't withstand that kind of force. Large metal machines just burst like air balloons. At the moment, people only explore the bottom of the Mariana Trench with the help of robots and drones. One such machine is Narius. This is an autonomous underwater vehicle that was built specifically for deep sea diving. It can withstand pressures 1,000 times greater than those on the surface and reach a depth of nearly 36,000 feet. In May 2009, Nereus got to the bottom of the Challenger Deep, the deepest known point on our planet. Thanks to this machine and its two cameras, people could watch what was going on at that enormous depth. But people have also set foot in the Challenger Deep. Back in 1960, the Trieste bath escape descended to its bottom. The vessel was carrying two crew members. Unfortunately, they couldn't see their surroundings well. There was only one small window in the bath escape. It helped the structure of the ship remain strong. Plus, to withstand the incredible pressure, the iron walls of the bath escape were five inches thick. But when the explorers reached the ocean floor in the Challenger Deep, one of the window's panes did crack. Luckily, the ship was still able to spend about 20 minutes at the bottom of the ocean and then rise to the surface. But there are living creatures that are used to such incredible conditions. The Mariana snailfish, for example, lives at a depth of 24,000 feet. Even the bottom of the Mariana Trench is inhabited. Bacteria and viruses live there. They're used to low temperatures and high pressure. And their food is all kinds of organic matter that sinks to the bottom of the ocean. People can also survive in other extreme conditions. For example, in space. It's a vacuum. Unlike what many people believe, it's not cold. It's also not as dense as air or water. That's why you'd lose your body heat very slowly. But you can do an experiment. Normally, water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Let's say you place a glass of water in a special chamber and gradually lower the pressure. The lower it is, the lower temperature the water needs to boil. You're 70% water. And since space is an almost absolute vacuum, the pressure there is extremely low, near zero. And now, think about what can happen with your very liquid blood. I believe you can imagine the consequences. Ouch. Also, your internal organs would begin to expand. But that's not a problem. Your tissues are flexible and can withstand such an experience. The main issue would be the lack of oxygen. Without air, you'd soon lose consciousness. And still, if the rescue team could get to you within one to two minutes, you'd be fine. But there are living organisms that can survive even there. One bacterial species was thriving in outer space near the International Space Station for three years. These bacteria don't mind the vacuum and the lack of oxygen. They've even managed to survive strong solar radiation. They rightfully deserve the title of the world's most resistant bacteria. It's one of the most intriguing locations in the world. Covered in darkness and miles underwater, this extreme environment is home to some unusual creatures and phenomena. It's called the Mariana Trench, and it's the deepest oceanic trench on Earth. No wonder it's been so difficult to explore. Because of the risky conditions, 
people aren't able to explore this location without proper equipment. But what would happen if we threw a steel ball down there? Let's start with some basics. How did they first discover this enormously deep hole in the ocean? HMS Challenger identified it back in 1875. The ship had some pretty fancy sounding equipment for its time, but it wasn't nearly good enough to be able to fully explore the trench. Some decades later, in 1951, another ship, the HMS Challenger II, came back to the location better equipped. The vessel featured an echo sounder and was able to take accurate measurements of what seemed to be the deepest point on the surface of our planet. If you were to look at it in 2D, you'd see the trench measures 1,500 miles in length and 43 miles in width on average. It also looks sort of like a crescent-shaped scar when you observe it from above. Nothing out of the ordinary so far, right? Well, if you were to stretch a wire from the surface of the ocean to the trench's deepest point, it would measure a staggering seven miles. If we were able to physically move Mount Everest, which is the Earth's tallest mountain, to cover the Mariana Trench, it still wouldn't be enough, falling short by about a mile. Because the Mariana Trench is so deep, it's almost completely covered in darkness, as light can barely get through to such extreme distances underwater. The temperature isn't any friendlier either, just a few degrees above freezing. But the most dangerous feature of them all is the water pressure. Right at the deepest point of the trench, the amount of pressure is about a thousand times higher than the standard atmospheric pressure. Not a lot of people ever attempted to descend into the Mariana Trench. In fact, the first organized attempt took place more than 60 years ago. It was done by Jacques Picard and Don Walsh in a submersible. They only spent about five hours on their descent and a mere 20 minutes at the bottom. Alas, they weren't able to take any pictures. Until these two scientists were able to descend, specialists believed there was little to no chance that life could exist down there, given the conditions, most notably the extreme pressure. But while at the bottom, the submersible's floodlight caught sight of a creature. It was a very flat one indeed. As you can imagine, resources here are very scarce. What kind of creatures live down here? And how do they survive, given the harsh environment? Surprisingly, there is quite an abundance of wildlife living in the Mariana Trench. Some of these creatures fall back on chemicals to survive, like methane or sulfur, while other kinds of fish nibble at the marine life that's, well, weaker than them on the food chain. The most common creatures found here are xenophyophores, amphipods, and small sea cucumbers. Some of them adapted by hardening up their shell using aluminum harnessed from the seawater. Smaller creatures, like microbes, adapted by feeding on the chemicals emitted when the seawater hits the underwater rocks. They consider the Mariana snailfish the rock star of the area in terms of wildlife. They're small, ranging from three to nine inches, translucent and lacking any scales, but they're the top beast of prey in the area. It's no wonder some people started to believe that the ancient megalodon might still be living here. What was a megalodon, you might be wondering? It was the largest predator ever known in our planet's history. Basically, the biggest and nastiest shark ever to have lived. Scientists believe it's been extinct for quite some time, and the idea that it might still be hiding in the Mariana Trench doesn't have a lot of supporting information. The megalodon would have needed to learn to navigate in complete darkness. It would either have to be bioluminescent or evolve to have massive eyes. More so, because of its school bus-like size, the megalodon would have needed a lot to eat. Microbes and small snailfish just wouldn't have done the trick. If a steel ball were to be dropped in the trench, what would be its effect on it? Would the ball be strong enough to sustain such pressure? Let's look at the science here. If we assume it's a solid steel ball, the pressure found at the bottom of the trench wouldn't be enough to really affect it and cause permanent damage. It would take it a solid 12 minutes to reach the bottom of the ocean, though. What about the temperature? Well, it turns out that the difference in temperature on the surface and at the bottom of the trench is quite impressive, a difference of about 86 degrees Fahrenheit. So, it would cause the ball to shrink a bit, but yet again, once the ball returns to the surface, it would simply come back to normal. Should the ball get stuck there, there's another interesting question to answer. 
would corrosion affect it? Corrosion of steel is highly dependent on the amount of oxygen in the water. The amount of oxygen dissolved in water remains constant at depths greater than 3 miles. I'll spare you the math, but it would take more than 10,000 years for the steel ball to completely rust under the sea. I can't help but wonder though, what would it take us humans to be able to survive at such extreme depths? Let's look at what was used in the past to explore this mysterious location. A little thing called syntactic foam. Why? Because it's the only material that can both float and resist the amount of pressure found here. Without this sort of protection, our lungs would rapidly collapse here. More so, the pressure from the water would push liquid into our mouths, replacing the much-needed oxygen with water. Then, there would be the much-needed ability to be able to come back to the surface, should anything not go as planned. One of the vessels that went for a deep dive here had 1,000-pound steel weights attached to it, so it would ensure its sinkage. These weights were connected to the ship by a special type of wire that had an increased corroding time of 11 to 13 hours in seawater, just in case something went wrong down there, and they'd have to bounce back faster. Given the harsh conditions here, the problem of oxygen supply is really important too. Any vessel looking to descend into the Mariana Trench again would need to consider some sort of device that can recycle the air in order to reduce the amount of oxygen that needs to be transported down there. And the last, but definitely not the least of all problems, would be electricity. There surely isn't a power socket down there for you to charge your phone. So, there needs to be enough battery life to support all the necessary equipment, communication, oxygen supply, lighting devices, and so on. None of these problems seem to be quite the challenge anymore, since, as of recently, you can buy a tour of the Mariana Trench. Three lucky individuals were part of such a project back in 2020. They were submerged in a 3.5-inch thick titanium sphere. This ensured that they didn't feel any pressure changes and physiological stresses whatsoever. Each of the guests took part in an individual trip that had an estimated length of about 14 hours. The descent itself took over four hours. Once they reached the bottom, they got the chance to witness some of the most extraordinary creatures on the planet. Then it was time to start the four-hour ascent back to the surface. Hey, my dear astronomers, last year was awesome. Two total lunar eclipses, a breathtaking ring of fire solar eclipse, and a rare alignment of Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. I bet you've been wondering what space wonders this year is going to bring us. Well, let's find out. From April 15th to April 29th, you'll be able to enjoy the Lyrid meteor shower. Meteor showers happen when our planet passes through debris left behind by comets and asteroids. That's why such showers normally occur approximately at the same time every year. The Lyrid meteor shower is produced by a comet called Thatcher. It takes around 415 years to orbit the Sun. By the way, this meteor shower is one of the oldest. People started watching it in 687 BCE. This year, the peak of the meteor shower will fall on the night of April 22nd, with almost 20 meteors per hour dashing across the dark sky. But if you miss the Lyrid meteor shower, don't worry. You can still see Eta Aquarid meteors from April 15th to May 27th. This meteor shower is famous for its fast meteors, leaving long, glowing trails. This shower is produced by the comet Halley, completing its orbit around the Sun every 76 years. Unfortunately, the full moon that will appear on May 5th might outshine most of the meteors, but astronomers promise it'll still be a pretty impressive show. Throughout all of June, Venus and Mars will be on the same astronomical line, looking as if they've been grouped together. And on the first official day of summer, Venus, Mars, and the Moon will form a triangle. You might even see the trio without any special equipment, since they'll be shining extremely brightly. And another meteor shower will start in July and last till September. It's called the Perseid meteor shower, and it's promised to be one of the best of the year. Bright and frequent, these meteors will have long tails and will light up the sky at a rate of 50 to 100 meteors per hour. 
The shower will peak when Earth moves through the densest region of space debris left behind by the comet Swift-Tuttle. On August 31st, you might notice that the full moon seems to be larger and brighter than usual. This phenomenon is called a supermoon. The moon, which follows an elliptical orbit, will be the closest to Earth. Even better, this year there will be four supermoons on July 3rd, August 1st, August 31st, and September 29th. And since there are two full moons in August, the second one is called a blue moon. It occurs every 2.5 years. On October 14th, people in the southwestern USA will be able to enjoy an annular solar eclipse. Now, look, solar eclipses happen when the moon passes between Earth and the sun. But this year, the moon won't cover the sun completely. That's why a dazzling glowing circle around the moon will be visible from certain places. This eclipse will be quite short. It'll last for around five minutes. On October 28th, we'll also see a lunar eclipse, but partial. The thing is, a total lunar eclipse happens when the Earth's shadow covers the entire surface of the moon. But this time, the moon will pass through our planet's dark shadow only partly. By the way, there is one more type of lunar eclipse called a penumbral. It occurs when Earth's faint outer shadow, called penumbra, obscures the moon. And finally, we'll see another meteor shower from November 19th to December 24th. It's called the Geminid meteor shower. This one is one more fan favorite. Super fast meteors travel at a speed of up to 78,000 miles per hour. Another unique thing about this phenomenon is that the Geminids come not from an icy comet, but from a rocky space body, an asteroid. Astronomers still aren't sure how the asteroid named Phaethon produces meteor showers. There's a theory that it might actually be a comet that once lost its icy shell. Interestingly, Phaethon measures a mere three miles across. This is surprising because the amount of debris it leaves behind is truly impressive. Anyway, the peak of this meteor shower is expected on the nights of December 13th and 14th, when stargazers will see up to 120 meteors per hour. 